All right, we'll begin inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. All right, uh, so we continue on with the chapter on sincerity and uh, intention from uh, the book of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam al nawi We have covered the first two hadith. Uh, there are total 12 hadith in this uh, chapter. So we've only done two so far, so we're going to try to maybe speed it up a bit. Uh, but the intention is to finish all 12 hadith by the end of class number five. So we have five uh, sessions, three sessions left, including today's. All right, so just a recap of what we did last week. We covered hadith number two, in, uh, which is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she says that Rasulullah said, an army will raid the Kaaba, and when it reaches a desert land, all of them will be swallowed up by the earth. She asked, O Messenger of Allah, why all of them? He answered, all of them will be swallowed up by the earth, but they will be raised for judgment according to their intentions. All right, so we said that, uh, this army, this is a future event that will happen. This is the army that uh, will be attacking uh, or sent to attach, uh, attack and get rid of Imam al-Mahdi who will take refuge uh, in Mecca in, uh, in the Kaaba and an army will be sent to uh, pursue them and when this army reaches a desert land then they will be swallowed up. Uh, so this is a Muslim army, right? It is a Muslim army uh, and uh, the entire army is going to be swallowed up However, they will all be raised according to their intentions because not everyone in the army had that goal in mind of attacking a raid in the Kaaba. Some of them were forced along the way. Right? Some of them did not know where this army was headed to. So not everyone in that army had the same goal and motive. So even though they're all going to be swallowed up, they're all going to be raised on the day of judgment according to their intention. So depending on their intention, uh, they, will, uh, they will determine if they will be punished or not for being part of this army. But they'll all be swallowed up on, uh, in, by the earth. And this is the danger of being in bad company. Being in bad company is that you share their same punishment in this life, even though in the next life you'll be judged according to your own specific intention. All right, we spoke about um, the, uh, how, the, how many times the Kaaba was built. Uh, and we said four times, right? That the Kaaba was built four times. Uh, first by Ibrahim and Ismail, then uh, in the days of uh, Quraysh, Jahiliyyah, before prophethood, during the time of Abdullah ibn Zubair, during the era of Yazid, and then uh, during the uh, time of Al-Hajjaj, during the era of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Uh, and the current foundations of the Kaaba were the foundations that was built by the Quraysh, not the original structure that was built by Ibrahim and Ismail but uh, the one that was built, the structure that was built by Quraysh during the days of Jahiliyyah. All right, we spoke about uh, some of the history of the Kaaba previously. Spain of Imam Malik. Uh, tawaf uh, and worship continues uh, day and night. And this is due to the hadith of Rasulullah SAW where he says that uh, addressing Bani, Bani Abdi Manaf that you must not prevent anyone who goes around this house and prays at any hour of the night or day he wishes. All right, now we said this army is the army that will be dispatched against Imam al-Mahdi. Uh, and this hadith is in Sunan Abi Dawood, where Rasulullah says that a disagreement will occur at the death of a caliph, a Khalifa, and a man of the people of Medina will come flying forth to Mecca. This is referring to Imam al-Mahdi. Some of the people of Mecca will come to him, bring him out against his will, and swear allegiance to him between the corner and the maqam. An expeditionary force will be sent against him from Syria, but they will be swallowed by the, uh, in the desert between Mecca and Medina when the people see that. Then the saints of Syria, Syria and the best people of Iraq will come and swear allegiance to him between the corner and the maqam. All right. Um, so this, in this particular incident, the Kaaba will not be destroyed All right, because this army will be swallowed up. But later on, to the very end of time, as one of the very last signs before the, end, uh, before the Day of Judgment, all right, one of the very last signs after the believers, the souls of the believers have all been lifted up, then one of the very last things that will happen is that the Kaaba will actually be destroyed uh, at the hands of a man by the name of Dhu as or this is a title or a kunya, Dhu as who will come from a place called Habasha and he will, he will be actually to actually destroy the Kaaba. All right, but what was mentioned in this hadith, the previous hadith is that uh, this army will raid the Kaaba, they will not be able to destroy it. They will not uh, harm the Kaaba because they will be swallowed up. Alright, and we said that punishment in the dunya due to being amongst evildoers. Right? But in the akhirah, everyone will be raised according to their intentions. And this is based on a verse in the Quran, Allah says, And fear a trial which will not strike those who have wronged among you exclusively, 
I know that Allah is severe in penalty. All right, so danger of being in the company of the evildoers, and also virtue of being in the company of righteous. And it comes in hadith, هُمُ الْقَوْمْ لَا يَشْقَى بِهِمْ جَلِيسُهُمْ Rasulullah says about the righteous people that even if somebody is not righteous, but he, he mixes amongst them, and he's in their company of the righteous people, then just by being in their company, this will be a cause for him to uh, benefit from uh, whatever they benefit from, and he will not be miserable, just by being uh, account of being in the company of the righteous. And we mentioned this dog in Surah Al-Kaf. Allah mentions uh, that uh, the Ashab Al-Kaf, they had a dog, uh, right? And this dog, so it's an animal that is impure, but nonetheless Allah mentions this dog as a, as a way of honoring the dog because it was in a company of righteous people. All right, uh, so that's a recap and review of what we did uh, in the previous hadith. We move on to hadith number three, uh, in which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, uh, this hadith is narrated by Aisha radiallahu anhu, who says that uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح ولكن جهاد ونية وإذا استنفرتم فانفروا uh, There is no immigration after the conquest of Mecca, but only jihad, striving and fighting in Allah's cause, will continue and good intention. So if you are summoned to fight, then go forth. If you're summoned to fight, then go forth. All right, so this hadith uh, <coughs> is talking about uh, the hijrah. Anybody knows what year did the hijrah occur in? What year? Huh? Not, not, the, uh, not the Gregorian calendar, the hijrah calendar. Yeah. What year did the, uh, not the hijrah, the, uh, the conquest of Mecca, sorry. What year did the conquest of Mecca occur? Okay, so it was occurred a certain amount of years after the Hijrah. Anybody knows when? How many? How many? Huh? Not ten. Close though. Eight. All right. So this occurred in the eighth year after Hijrah. In the eighth year after Hijrah. All right. Um, yeah. I migrated to Medina. Yes. Yes, yes, so eight years after, so eight years after he was kicked out of Mecca, he returned eight years later to conquer Mecca. So eight years after. All right, what do we understand from this hadith? لا هجرة بعد الفتح ولكن جهاد ونية There is no immigration after conquest. Anybody uh, can kind of um, say what they understand from this hadith? What does it mean that there is no hijrah anymore after the conquest of Mecca? Anyone? Possibly. It just means that you only keep one hijrah. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Good. Why? Good. All right. So essentially, it that Mecca has now become Darul Islam, right? It is now a place of Iman and, and Muslims. So there's no, there's no, uh, now you can migrate still from Mecca to Medina, but that will not be a religious migration. Why? Because Mecca is no longer in the hands of disbelievers. So because it's no longer in the hands of disbelievers, if a person was to migrate, they would not get that reward that which was previously available, right? So that, there was a reward of, from migrating to, um, from, Mecca to, from Mecca to Medina. There was a, a, a great reward. Allah talks about the migration of the Qur'an and there's a lot of uh, virtues and reward uh, in store for the one who migrated. After Mecca is conquered, that hijrah is no longer available, right? Because there's no need anymore to migrate from Mecca to Medina because Mecca is now the abode of the believers, now Darul Islam. And this hijrah was, by the way, it was, it was, it was, it was my, uh, mandatory, right? It was mandatory to migrate uh, from Mecca to Medina. Whoever was not able to migrate, then Allah has actually a very strong uh, warning, right? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِ أَنفُسِهِمْ Those who, when the angels come, they take their souls, and they are wronging themselves. And it said to them, فِيمَا كُنْتُمْ oh, You know, what, what, what did you guys, what was, you know, what did you do? قَالُوا uh, They will say, كُنَّا مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ That we were weak. Uh, on earth, 
or we are weak and feeble. And then it will be said to them, قَالُوا أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعًا It was not the earth spacious and wide. فَتُحَاجِرُوا فِيهَا So in other words, did you not have the opportunity to make hijrah? Uh, and of course they didn't make the hijrah. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمَ Allah has very strong words for those who, not, who did not make the hijrah without any excuse. Of course there was people who remained in Mecca who were not able to migrate. All right? they, because they were either too weak or they didn't have the necessary means to migrate. But those who had the opportunity to migrate and they did not, then there are strong verses uh, about that for those who did not migrate because it was wajib. It was mandatory to migrate once you were able to. All right, so Allah says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ That Jahannam is a boat for those who had that opportunity. So very strong warning uh, uh, and threat against those who did not migrate. So migration was mandatory. Uh, and after Mecca was conquered, then now there is no more uh, need for migration from Mecca to Medina. However, does that does that mean that the concept of hijrah is no more? All right. Does that mean that there's no more? There's no such thing as hijrah anymore in in, uh, in 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 general. All right. So hijrah still exists. All right. Meaning that if a person is in a situation where they're not able to practice their religion in one land, this concept of moving to another land to practice their religion still exists. Right, so this concept is, has not been abrogated. But what has been abrogated is the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. That specific hijrah is no longer there, is no longer available. All right, but the concept of hijrah still remains. Meaning that if a person is in a place in the land where they're not able to practice a religion, and they move, or they migrate to a land where they can practice a religion, then this is a hijrah that there still, that there still is reward in. All right, uh, and... <clears throat> So the Surah says that there's no more uh, hijrah after the Fath of Mecca. Right? That, that option is no longer there. Um, however, he says that the, uh, then is hadith, but there's still jihad and niyyah, meaning that you can still obtain rewards. So you cannot obtain rewards anymore in hijrah from Mecca to Medina. Right? That, that road or that, uh, that door is closed. That door of reward is closed now. All right? So after Mecca was conquered, now nobody has that opportunity to earn that great reward of migrating from Mecca to Medina. That reward, that door has been closed. However, Rasulullah is encouraging the companions that there's still, the door of reward is still open in other areas, such as jihad and good intention. So you can still earn rewards, right? The, the, the door of rewards is not closed. However, the door of hijrah, specifically from Mecca to Medina, that door is closed. All right, uh, in this hadith is also a prophecy. All right, a prophecy. Prophet is predicting something. Which is what? Anybody can, can derive from that? Mm -hmm. Good, exactly. So there's a prophecy which is that Mecca will remain a Muslim uh, city. Right? Because he's saying there is no more hijrah anymore to, uh, to Medina. Which is implying that Mecca will always remain the uh, abode of, of the Muslims. لَا هِجْرَةَ بَعْدَ الْفَتْحِ وَلَكِنْ جِهَادٌ وَنِيَّ وَإِذَا سُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا And if you're summoned to fight, then go forth. Meaning if the, uh, the, the leader of the Muslims, he summons people to battle, then, this, then battle becomes obligatory uh, at that time. Alright, any questions on this hadith? Alright, so this was Fath uh, al-Makkah, eight year after Hijrah. Warning of the Quran for those who do not know the Hijrah, the verse we mentioned, uh, chapter number four, verse 97. Indeed, those whom the angels take in death while wronging themselves. The angels will say, in what condition were you? They will say, we were oppressed in the land. So the angels will say, Where was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to migrate therein? For those, their refuge is hell. And evil it is as a destination. So it's a very, a very stern verse about uh, those who did not make the hijrah. Because hijrah was mandatory. If you had the opportunity to go, then you had to go. You had to migrate from Mecca to Medina because this was pres preservation of your religion. And Allah says in the Quran, وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ That fitna. And the scholars of Tafsir have said that the fitna here is referring to disbelief. Right? Disbelief. Disbelief is worse than killing. Right? In other words, it's, uh, it's better to preserve your religion all right, and protect yourself against disbelief, even if that means losing your life, even if it's, it means being killed. Well, fitna tu ashadu min al qatl. So this was mandatory for them to, to make the hijrah uh, as long as Mecca was Dawr al Kufra, it was a place uh, of disbelief. But once it became a place of Islam, then it is no longer, uh, that, that reward is no longer there. Alright, prophecy, Mecca will remain down with Islam, 
All right, Hijrah to Mecca is no more, as we said. All right, that specific Hijrah is no more. But this concept remains. The concept of Hijrah remains when conditions are met, meaning that a person is in a situation where they are not able to practice a religion, and there's another land where they can migrate and practice a religion. Uh, so this, they can go and migrate, and this would be a Hijrah, and they would receive rewards for that, and this door is still open. All right, but the Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, that Hijrah is no more. All right, and as Rasulullah says at the end of the hadith, jihadun wa niyyah, meaning you can still get the reward in jihad and niyyah, even though the reward for hijrah from Mecca to Medina, that has closed and no one has that opportunity anymore. All right, any questions on this hadith before we move on to hadith number four? Yeah. So basically hijrah is migration. Hijrah is migration, yes. The type of opposition to hijrah was only one from Mecca to Medina. Yeah, so that hijrah is with a capital H, you'd say, right? The Hijrah, we're talking about Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. But Hijrah in general, uh, there was Hijrah before that, when the Muslim migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. All right? And it can happen as well afterwards, as long as the conditions are met. All right? As long as the conditions are met. Yeah. A good question. So, can this apply to Palestine? Um, Allahu Alam. But. Palestine, it's, it's a bit of a different issue because this is not just any land, right? This is a sacred land. Yeah. So if all the Muslims leave, then now this is a, a holy uh, place of Islam. We've, we've left it in the hands of disbelievers. Yeah. So from that angle, uh, if some Muslims need to migrate because they're, they're, they're not able to live there and they have the opportunity, maybe they can, they can leave. But for all the Muslims to, to, to mass migrate and leave that land completely, then Allah Alam, this would uh, not be allowed. All right, hadith number four. Uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari radiallahu anhu narrates, Inna bil Madinati la rijalan ma sirtum masiran, wa la qata'tum wadiyan, illa kanu ma'akum habasahum al marad, wa fi riwaya illa sharakukum fil ajr. Jabir uh, narrates, the Rasulullah said, We accompanied the Prophet in an expedition. And uh, when he said, there are some men in al Medina who are with you wherever you march and whichever valley you cross. They have not joined you in person because of their illness. In another version, they share the reward with you. Uh, this expedition is mentioned in uh, the next narration, which is the expedition of Tabuk. So it's not mentioned explicitly here, but it is mentioned in the next narration we'll read afterwards, where it is said that it is the expedition of Tabuk. All right, so we'll read the other narration. رَجَعْنَا مِنْ غَزْوَةِ تَبُوكَ مَعَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إن أقواما خلفنا بالمدينة ما سلكنا شعبا ولا واديا إلا وهم معنا حبسهم العذر It's narrated by Bukhari from Anas ibn Malik who says we were coming back from the battle of Tabuk with the Prophet صلى when he remarked there are people whom we left behind in al Medina who accompanied us in spirit in every pass and valley we crossed they remained behind they remained behind for a valid excuse all right, so this is talking about the, uh, the battle of Tabuk, the Ghazwa of Tabuk. Anybody knows when this happened? So this was, I'll give you a hint, this was the last expedition of the Prophet ﷺ. All right, this is the very last expedition that he put, uh, took, took part in. Anyone want to take a guess of when did the expedition of Tabuk occur? Let's give the Hijrah, uh, Hijrah, after how many years after Hijrah? So when we say dates, we're talking all automatically hijrah. Ten years, just ten years. Close. Huh? Nine? Correct. All right, so this occurred in the ninth year. Ninth year uh, after hijrah. Right, and this was the last uh, ghazwa, the last expedition that Rasulullah took part in. Uh, and in this uh, battle, uh, it was, actually there was no battle. So they marched all the way to a place called Tabuk, which is like in present-day Syria. Uh, to uh, in intending to fight the Romans, the Byzantines. When they got there, they found that they actually ran away. So there was actually no battle. But the real battle was, uh, was in the march towards Tabuk and the preparation for it because it was a very difficult journey. This was like a month's journey, months long, a few months long journey. It was in the dead heat of the summer. All right, and it was a very long journey. And so Rasulullah usually he would not give any indication when he would go in a battle where he was going. He usually would just, you know, he wouldn't announce it. But in this particular battle, he announced way before, we're going to uh, this place, everybody prepare. 
all right, because the journey was very difficult. So uh, they went on the journey, and it was a very difficult journey, but a number of people remained behind. Right? A number of Muslims re remained behind. And uh, those who remained behind, there are three categories of people. Right? The first category were those who did not have the means to go, to go. For this battle in particular, you needed a riding animal. You could not go, you can't, you can't walk. Right? It was way too far to walk. So you needed uh, transportation. If you didn't have transportation, then you couldn't go. All right, so there were people who came to Rasulullah uh, and they, they wanted him to provide them transportation. And he told them, <coughs> he told them that قل, قل, قل ما أحملكم علي. I have no way, way of providing for you any transportation. And they, they, turn, they, they, had to, they, had, they were forced to stay behind and they were crying. They were, they were, they were, they were saddened because they couldn't partake in the battle. All right, so the, this is the first category of people who couldn't partake in the battle because they didn't have any means of getting there. The second category are those who are weak and sick. All right, so there are people who are weak, sick, injured, who are not able to undertake that difficult journey, and much less fight in the battle. And Allah excuses those people in the Quran, laysa ala al-a'ma haraj wa ala al-maridi haraj, and so on. Right? So the, uh, Allah excused those people who had a legitimate excuse. And then the third were the, actually there's four categories of people who stayed behind. Right? So the first two, the first is the, those who didn't have the means to travel. The second are those who uh, had a legitimate excuse, sickness, uh, old age, weakness. The third were people who stayed behind because they were hypocrites, munafiqun. They had actually no intention of going out whatsoever. And they, they came up with a bunch of excuses of why they couldn't make it. All right, that's the third category. And the fourth category are people who had no excuse whatsoever. They were believers. They had no legitimate excuse. And they simply just uh, did not make the preparations needed to go. Right, and these were actually three companions. We had uh, we, we we mentioned that story, right? Of um, these three companions who remained behind. Anybody remember? It was the hadith of who? Kaab ibn Malik, right? Kaab ibn Malik. We have mentioned this in a uh, lecture way back last year, right? So this is the fourth category of people who remained behind. They had no excuse. They just simply you know procrastinated and they ended up remaining behind. <clears throat> right. So the Tabuk expedition occurred in the ninth year of. Uh, after the Hijrah. This was the last Ghazwa of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those who remained behind, one, number one, those who had no means to go. Number two, those who were sick or too weak. Number three, the hypocrites. Number four, sincere believers who had no excuse. All right, now uh, what Rasulullah Sallam mentions in the hadith is that <clears throat> these people who are in category number one and two, all right, they are in category number one and two, meaning that they wanted to go on the battle. They intended to go but because they didn't have transportation or because they were weak or because they were sick, they were unable to go. What is the status of these people? They share the same reward as those who went. So as they were on their way back, Rasulullah says to the companions that there are some people in Medina. They remain behind in Medina, but they are with you wherever you march, on whatever valley you cross. They have not joined you in person because of their illness, but they share with you in the reward. So they got the same exact reward. Why? Because their intention. They had the intention to go out. So because of their intention, their sincere intention, Allah gave them the same reward as those who actually went forth. All right, in another narration, he says that they, uh, they are people whom we left behind in Medina who accompanied us, us in spirit. In every pass and valley we crossed, they will remain behind for a valid excuse. All right, so this shows the importance and benefits of intention, that you can still reward, get rewards of certain things just by your intention, even if you don't actually get to carry out what you intended, but just by the mere intention, you can still earn reward. So these people, they, they, they attain the reward of as if they went in the battle, as if they went into the expedition, even though they remain behind uh, in their house, in their homes. All right, another hadith mentioned something very similar. Hadith, whenever a slave falls ill or travels, then he will get rewards similar to that he gets for good deeds at home when he is in good health. So if you are, you know, uh, <clears throat> you're, used to, uh, you're, you're used to doing certain practices when you're in good health or when you're in residency. And then either you fall in bad health or you're traveling. So you, don't, you no longer have that opportunity to do those things you used to do. For example, a person, they always pray all of their sunnah. Right? So they pray the farth, of course, but they always pray all of the sunnah. Or they, or they pray qiyamul layl. And then they get sick. Right? So sickness comes to them. But they, they had this habit of, and practice of making these extra salawat, these voluntary prayers. So in their sickness, they still get that reward. 
right? Because the sickness is a valid excuse that's preventing them. So they still get that reward as if they're doing it, right? Just because they used to do it when they were healthy. Or if they're traveling, right? Uh, so in residency, they used to do all the salawat, the, the voluntary prayers. They travel, now, the, you know, the, they're in, in, in a place where they're not able to, the time is constricted or whatever reason. They're not able to do what they used to do in residency. They get those same rewards. Right? They get the same rewards as if they were at home in good health. All right, so this shows uh, importance and attention. And uh, just by mere intention, even if you don't, you're not carrying out the action, you can still get the rewards just by your intention. All right, well, we have the example of uh, Uthman ibn Affan, the Battle of Badr. All right, so Uthman ibn Affan, uh, he did not participate in Badr. And the Battle of Badr was a battle that it actually didn't occur uh, by, uh, by uh, it wasn't planned. It was spontaneous meeting. So Rasulullah he went out with a group of the companions to raid a caravan. They were not intended to have a battle. They intended to raid the caravan of Quraysh, which had their belongings the Quraysh stole from them when they migrated. So they intended to go and raid the caravan. Uh, once the news got to Quraysh that the caravan is going to be raided, then they prepared an army uh, led by Abu Jahl and other um, of the chiefs of Quraysh. And they went out to meet the, the Muslims and that's when the battle occurred. So this battle was not planned. Uh, so there are some Muslims who remained behind. Uh, amongst them was Uthman ibn Affan. He remained behind, but he had a legitimate excuse. Anybody knows what that excuse was? His wife, good. So he had to tend to his sick wife. So Rasulullah told him, stay back. You stay back. And by the way, who was his wife? The right, the daughter of Rasulullah which was Ruqayya. Uh, and she actually did die. Right? So he was tending to and caring for her. She did pass away. And then later on, Uthman married another daughter of Rasulullah by the name of Um Kulthul. Um Kulthul. So Uthman married two of the daughters of Rasulullah and she also passed away later on as well, Um Kulthum. And Rasulullah said to him that if I had a third daughter, I would have married uh, her to you. And Uthman was known as, what was his nickname? Anybody know? Dhun Nurain, right? The possessor of two lights because he married two daughters of Rasulullah. So Uthman did not partake in the battle, but he had a legitimate excuse. And so he is actually considered to be from the Baduri, Baduriyun. Right? He's considered to be uh, those who participated in Badr. And Rasulullah gave him a share of the spoils of war, even though he was not there physically. But because he intended to go, but he had a legitimate excuse for not going, then he still got the reward as though he participated in the Battle of Badr and he was also given a share of the spoils of war. Right? All based on his intention. Right? A modern example of this concept of just having the intention, even if you're not able to fulfill the action. Anybody has a modern example? Think about a major event that happened a few years ago. Major event. COVID, right? What happened during COVID? The messages were closed. All right, the messages were closed. Even if you wanted to come and pray, you couldn't pray. All right, so somebody was used to coming praying pray in jama'ah every single day. Never misses Salat al-Jama'ah. And all of a sudden, COVID comes and the messages are closed. No one's allowed inside. That person, inshallah, is still getting the reward. Right? They're still getting the reward of praying in the jama'ah during that entire duration when the message was closed. Because they used to pray, and they had the intention of continuing to do so, even, uh, even when the masajid mas were closed. Right? So even uh, <coughs> example, uh, a modern example would be during the time of COVID, when the, all the masajid were closed, you couldn't do certain things, but if you had that intention to do it, and you used to do it when there were no barriers to do so, then you can, you can continue to get that same reward, even uh, when you're prevented from doing so. So inshallah, those, all those people who were coming to the masajid regularly, uh, and then COVID came and closed all the masajid, or those who intended to go for hajj, and they weren't able to go for hajj, or whatever uh, good they intended to do, and they were prevented from doing so because of the restrictions of COVID, inshallah, they still get those same rewards by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, we have a hadith, uh, which is also on the same uh, concept. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, The likeness of this nation is that of four people. A man to whom Allah gives wealth and knowledge. So the first person, category number one, or person number one, he is given, Allah has given this person wealth and knowledge. So he acts according to his knowledge uh, with regard to his wealth. So because of his knowledge, he spends his wealth according to the way it should be spent. Spending it as it should be spent. 
All right, so that's the person number one. Person number two, a man to whom Allah gives knowledge, but he does not give him wealth. So what does he say? He says that if I had been given wealth like this one, I would have done what the first man did. All right, so this person, he has knowledge, but he does not have the wealth. So he's not able to spend like the first person is able to spend. So what does the Messenger of Allah He says that they will be equal in reward just because of his intention. So he intended, he has sincere intention that if I had the wealth like this person had, I would spend it in Allah's cause just like this person spent it. Rasulullah says that they are in reward the same. They get the same reward. Even though he didn't spend any wealth, but he had that sincere intention to spend it if he had been given that wealth. And so he, they are equal in reward. On the flip side, and a man to whom Allah gives wealth but does not give knowledge. So he squanders his wealth and spends it in inappropriate ways. All right, so that's the person number three. So this person, uh, he has no knowledge, but he's been given wealth. But what does he do with the wealth? Because he doesn't have any knowledge, he squanders the wealth and he spends it in a way that it should not be spent. All right, and then the fourth person is a man whom Allah gives neither knowledge nor wealth. And he says, if I had wealth like this one, meaning the third person, the one who was given knowledge, or who was not given knowledge, but given wealth, and he squandered his wealth. So now, person number four says, if I had been given wealth like person number three, I would do whatever he did, which is squander the wealth like he squandered it. The Messenger of Allah said they are equal in sin. They were equal in sin because he had that intention that if I had been given wealth, I would squander it and spend it inappropriately, inappropriately just like person number three spent it. So they are equal in sin. All right, so it works both ways. So you, by your intention, you can re attain a reward of spending even though you don't have the wealth to spend. If you had the sincere intention to spend like those who have been given the wealth and they spend it in Allah's cause, you can get that same reward. On the flip side, you can get the same punishment if you have that intention to spend it as the one who spends it inappropriately and squanders his wealth. All right, so this is... Uh, Encouragement is also warning. It's also a warning, but encouragement as well that rewards are there with your intention, all right? If you have this sincere intention. All right, uh, we'll take questions on this hadith before we move on to hadith number five. Yes. Yes, that's, that is hadith. Uh, we'll, we'll mention that hadith later on. Yes, that hadith comes, um, <clears throat> which is if a person intends to do good, a good deed, they get a reward for it, even if they don't do it. Once they do the deed, then they get another reward. And a person who intends to do evil, just by that intention, he doesn't get any sin. However, if he does it, then he gets a sin. All right, so that's a hadith. We'll mention that's hadith Qudsi. And it does seem to contradict this hadith. Right? Um, but the scholars have mentioned that for this hadith, uh, the difference is, is that the one who, in this hadith, uh, he made a, like a firm intention, all right? versus a person who just like had, a, had that thought in their, in their head. All right? So when, when are you held accountable for your intention? If it reaches a level of I, uh, like firmness, firmness of I'm, I am going to squander this wealth if I get it, then you can be held accountable for it, versus a person who uh, has like just like the intention, but it didn't reach the level of uh, firmness in actually carrying it out. All right. So in that hadith, I will mention it later on. Uh, it, it it does say that just by merely intending evil, you don't necessarily get a sin for it. Only if you do the sin, then you get the, the, then you commit the sin, then you get the, it's written against you. Uh, but this hadith seems to indicate that you can also get the sin even just by intending. But we said that this is referring to if a person makes that firm intention. Right? You had that firm intention. Uh, to do so, then it will be written as though you did it, uh, as, the, as though you were the one who did it. Wallahu a'lam. Any other questions on this hadith? All right, uh, hadith number five. Uh, this hadith is narrated by Ma'an ibn Yazid ibn, uh, ibn Akhnas, who says that, كان أبي يزيد أخرج دنانيرا يتصدق بها فوضعها عند رجل في المسجد فجئت فأخذتها فأتيته بها فقال والله ما إياك أردت فخاصمته إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال لك ما نويت يا يزيد ولك ما أخذت يا معن 
Uh, so Ma'an ibn Yazid, uh, ibn Akhnas, he reported, now he is a, a Sahabi. Uh, so if you notice it says here, uh, may Allah be pleased with them. Because he is a Sahabi, his father is a Sahabi, and also his grandfather is a Sahabi. This doesn't occur very often. But uh, this is one of the rare occasions where you have three generations, they're all Sahaba. So he's a Sahabi, Ma'an ibn Yazid, and his father is a Sahabi, and his grandfather was a Sahabi as well. Um, what is a Sahabi? What is the definition of a Sahabi? Anyone? Okay. All right. So, okay. Anybody else? So that's part of it. Companions. But what does it mean to be a companion? Okay. Good. So belief. You have to believe in him, all right? Because there's a lot of kufar who fought the Prophet and they interacted with him, but they didn't believe in him. All right, so a Sahabi is, number one, somebody who met Rasulullah during his life, right? During the Messenger of life. Meaning that if somebody claims to meet Rasulullah in a dream or even a state of wakefulness after, they would not be considered a Sahabi. All right, so you have to meet Rasulullah in his lifetime uh, while believing in him. So a person who met Rasulullah but they didn't believe in him, right? And then later on they became a Muslim. They're not, a, they're not considered to be Sahabi, all right? You have to meet the Rasulullah and believe in him. You met him while believing in him. Even for a moment. So when we, talk, when we say that somebody's a Sahabi, it doesn't necessarily mean that they accompanied the Rasulullah for months or years. Even if somebody who met him for a moment, they are considered Sahaba. So this is why those who met Rasulullah during the farewell Hajj, and they, were, they said over like 100,000, they are all considered Sahaba, even though they, they only interacted with Rasulullah maybe uh, a minute or two, all right. But they're 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 still considered Sahaba. So they they met Rasulullah in his life. They believed in him, uh, and they died on Iman. Also very important. They died on Iman. So if somebody believed in him, they met him. They believed in him, but then they left Islam afterwards. Then they're not considered Sahaba. All right. So Sahabi is specifically a person who met Rasulullah during his life. They believed in him, even if for a moment they met him, and they died on Iman. All right, so in this hadith, uh, <clears throat> uh, he, Ma'an ibn Yazid, he, he says that my father set aside some dinars for charity and gave them to a man in the masjid. So I went to that man, he said, and I took back those dinars. So his father gave charity, but his father was not intending that his son take the charity. Right? He was intending somebody else take the charity. But his son, Ma'an, he went to the masjid and he took those same dinars that his father intended for charity. So he goes back to his house and he meets his father and they come to a realization that he took the, the, the charity that his father had intended for somebody else. So his father says to him, I, did not, I had not intended you to be given. Right? I didn't intend you to get the, the charity. I intended for other, perp, other, other, other people. So we went to the Messenger وسلم, and we put forth the matter before him. And so he said to my father, O oh Yazid, you have been rewarded for what you intended. Right? So you get the reward even though that sadaqah did not reach your intended target. But you get the reward just on your intention. So he didn't intend for his son to take that. Right? He didn't want his son. He wanted somebody else to take that, uh, that charity. But he still gets the reward based on his intention. And he said to Ma'an that you are entitled uh, to whatever you have taken. So what you have taken is halal for you. Even though it was not intended that you take it, you uh, are allowed to take that and it is halal for you to take. All right, so they both get whatever they, uh, so the, the, the father gets what he intended, even though the, the charity did not reach the intended target. And the son is allowed to keep that money, even though that charity was not meant for him to, to take. All right, uh, so in this hadith, we see also that uh, it is allowed to delegate, right? You're allowed to delegate certain, uh, certain actions can be delegated. So in this case, the father delegated somebody to give sadaqah on his behalf. All right? he, get, he delegated somebody to give sadaqah on his behalf. All right? So there are certain actions that you can delegate somebody else to do, such as giving sadaqah. All right? Anything else? What else can you delegate somebody to do on your behalf? All right, someone who's alive who is not able to make hajj. They can delegate somebody to do it. All right? You can delegate somebody to distribute your zakah. All right, so, so there are certain actions that you can delegate somebody to do. 
and this is one of them. So you can delegate somebody to uh, distribute your sadaqah or distribute your zakat. Right? And there's certain actions that you can't delegate anybody to do. And this would be any uh, act of worship, bodily act of worship. You cannot, you can't, somebody, you can't, send, you can't say to somebody, "Can you pray salat al for me?" Right? Or can you, you know, I'm not able to make salat al today. Can you pray on my behalf? Right? So acts of worship, bodily acts of worship, you can you cannot delegate that. That has to be done by you, with the exception of Hajj, right? For a person who is unable to do so, they can delegate, or after they pass away, then somebody can do it on their, on their behalf. And with fasting, if a person dies and they had fasting owed, there's a different opinion amongst the scholars whether a person can fast on their behalf or do they have to feed on their behalf. There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars, but some scholars they do say that a person can fast on their behalf. Other than that, things like salah, you cannot delegate anybody to do. All right, uh, we also see from this hadith that the son, right, he took his father to court. All right, we can say he took his father to Rasulullah to have a judgment. So just the mere action of taking your father to court is not considered to be disobedience. Right? We have something called uquq al-walidain, which is disobeying parents. All right? Just merely the concept of just taking, uh, going to uh, arbitration, if you have a matter, a matter to settle or dispute, that's not considered to be a form of disobedience. Right? Just that mere action. It can be. It can lead to it. But uh, if whatever, for whatever reason, a father and a son have an excuse, whether it's a, um, a monetary di uh, dispute or anything else, and they go to uh, the, the court, then this would not be considered to be the son being disobedient to his father, right? Because uh, this hadith, the Rasulullah did not chastise the son for, for bringing this issue uh, up to him. All right, and we see that the uh, reward is established just by the intention, just by uh, the father intending to uh, donate and give this charity, he received the reward even though it was not, uh, it did not go to who he intended it to go. All right, anybody have a question on this hadith? Any questions on this hadith before we move on? All right, um, moving on. Hadith number six, long hadith. Anna Rasulullah uh, sallallahu this hadith is narrated by Sa'ad. Ibn Abi Waqas, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Inna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya'uduni ala a'ama hajjat al-wada' min waja'in ishtadda bi faqultu inni qad balagha bi min al-waja'i wa ana dhu malin wa la yarithuni illa abnatun afa atasaddaqu bi thuluthay mali qala la faqultu bi shatli faqala la thumma qala al-thuluthu wa thuluthu kabir aw kathir innaka an tadhara warathataka aghniya khayrun min an tadharahum aalatan yatakafafun al-nas وإنك لن تنفق نفقة تبتغي بها وجه الله إلا أجرت بها حتى ما تجعل في في امرأتك فقلت يا رسول الله أخلف بعد أصحابي قال إنك لن تخلف فتعمل عملا صالحا إلا ازددت به درجة ورفعة ثم لعلك أن تخلف حتى ينتفع بك أقوام ويضر بك آخرون اللهم أمضي لأصحابي هجرتهم ولا تردهم على عقابهم لكن البائس سعد بن خولة يرثي له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن مات بمكة. This hadith is narrated by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. He says that uh, so Amir, the son of Sa'ad ibn Waqas is narrating. He says that his father said, in the year of the last Hajj of the Prophet صلى الله عليه I became seriously ill, and the Prophet صلى used to visit me inquiring about my health. I told him I am I am reduced to this state because of illness, and I am wealthy, and I have no inheritors except a daughter. Uh, in this hadith, the, the narrator, uh, the narration of the name Amr bin Saad is mentioned, and in fact, it is a mistake. The narrator is Aisha. All right, so it's actually his daughter narrated this from his, from the father Saad, not his uh, son. Should I give two thirds of my property? So he's on his death, or he thinks he's on his deathbed. All right, so he wants to uh, give some charity because he believes that he is on his deathbed. So he asks Rasulullah "Should I give two thirds of my my wealth in charity?" So Rasulullah said, "No, do not give two thirds." So he said, what about half? And Rasulullah said, no. Then he said, what about one third? And Rasulullah said, okay, one third, but one third is still a lot. A thuruth wa thuruthu kabir, or kathir. Some narrations mentioned kabir, some narrations mentioned kathir. Most of the narrations mentioned kathir. And then he said, Rasulullah said to Sa'ad, you would be better off leaving your inheritors wealthy 
rather than leaving them poor, begging others. Right? It's better for you to leave those who inherit from you wealthy rather than you, you give your charity to others and then your inheritors and your family members after you die, they are left to beg others. So it's better that you give them, you make them wealthy and rich uh, so they don't have to beg and ask other people rather than you give your, your wealth away to non-family. And then Rasulullah said, you will get a reward for whatever you spend for Allah's sake, even for whatever you put in your wife's mouth. I said, O Messenger of Allah, will I be left alone after my companions have gone? Right? He's afraid that he's going to die in Mecca. Right? He's afraid he's going to die in Mecca. He was one of those who made the hijrah. Uh, and, and he's afraid that he was gonna, he's going to lose the reward of the hijrah right, if he dies in Mecca. And then he said, uh, then Rasulullah said to him, if you are left behind, whatever good deeds you do, will upgrade you and raise you, raise you high. And perhaps you will have a long life so that some people will be benefited by you while others will be harmed by you. And then Rasulullah made dua, O oh Allah, complete the emigration of my companions and do not turn them renegades. But Allah's Messenger felt sorry for poor Sa'd ibn Khawla as he died in Mecca. Alright, so uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, of course, he's uh, one of the major uh, companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's one of the, uh, the ten uh, who were promised paradise. One of Al-Ashar al-Mubashirin ibn Jannah. He was one of the ten who was, who was promised uh, in their lifetime uh, paradise. And he was also one of the, the first persons to throw a spear in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he's a lot of other uh, virtues that we don't have time to mention. But he is uh, suffice to know that he is one of the ten that Rasulullah promised paradise. Uh, so he became very ill during the farewell Hajj, and uh, this was the farewell Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu and it was the only Hajj he performed. So Rasulullah did not perform Hajj other than this. This was the last Hajj and only Hajj that he performed. So he was feeling, uh, he got ill, and he said that I am wealthy, I have a lot of wealth. And this shows the permissibility of gathering wealth, that it is not sinful to gather wealth and to be rich. And many of the Sahaba were rich, right? Amongst them, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Uthman was very rich. They were known to be very rich. So there is no issue in being rich and gathering wealth as long as you fulfill the rights of that wealth. So he says that I, am, uh, I'm, I have a lot of uh, wealth and I'm very sick. He thinks that he's dying. He thinks he's on his deathbed. So he said, I have no inheritors except a daughter. Except a daughter. So he wanted to give a, a, a huge chunk of his wealth away in charity as a bequest. As a, uh, either, he, either he wanted to give it while he's alive, uh, while he's still alive, or he wanted to bequest it after he dies. Meaning after he dies, then let this money go uh, to uh, charity. And he said that he only had one daughter. All right, now the daughter, if he has, a person has one daughter, uh, anybody knows how, uh, so he has only one daughter. How much does the daughter in inherit? Anybody knows? If the daughter is alone. So he has no other children. All right, he has no other children, and he only has one daughter. Anybody knows how much the daughter inherits? All right, let's open up the Surah Nisa, verse 11. And who can, who can find the answer first? Surah Nisa, verse 11. Pull out your phones, or the Quran. Mm, not quite. Surah Nisa verse 11. If the daughter, if there's only one daughter, how much does she inherit? Half. All right. All right. So she, the, the daughter, if she's alone, she inherits uh, half. All right. So this daughter would have inherited half, half of, his, uh, of his wealth. So he asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all right, um, can I donate two thirds? And Rasulullah said, no, that's too much. Then he asked about half. Rasulullah said, that's too much. And then a third, he said, okay, a third, he allowed a third. But he also said that a third is still a lot. And then he said that it's better for you to leave this money. Let your inheritors inherit from it rather than giving it away. And then having your family beg and ask the people afterwards. All right, uh, so a person is able to uh, give away one third of their so this, uh, this applies to a person who is on their deathbed now what, if you are alive right, in normal living you can do whatever you want with your wealth right? you can give away all of it you can give away half of it as much as you want right? when you are alive and healthy you can give away as much wealth as you want if you want to donate everything you can do so but once you reach your deathbed right, uh, your person is on their deathbed they are in the sickness of death 
then they are not allowed to, to, to give away more than one-third of their wealth, based on this hadith. Right? So you're not allowed to give away more than one-third of your wealth once you've reached on your deathbed. And even one-third is still a lot, as Rasulullah says, a thuluth wa thuluthu kathir. Still a lot. It's actually better, as he says later on in hadith, that it's better that you leave all of your money, or a majority of it, for those who are, will inherit from you, so that they, you, leave them, you, leave, you, leave, you, leave, you leave them well off. So they don't have to beg and ask the people after you have left this world. Right, and this hadith also uh, is, a, um, is a, a prophecy. Because Rasulullah says at the end of the hadith that perhaps you will live a long life. And this perhaps meaning that he's saying you will. Right? When, when Rasulullah says perhaps, it means that you will live a long life. And, and Sa'ad ibn Waqas, he did not die uh, in this incident. He thought he was dying. He thought he was on his deathbed, but actually... He ended up living uh, much longer. He ended up living actually 50 years after this incident. And at this time, he had one daughter. By the time he died, he had uh, over 20 children. He had 17 boys and 12 girls. So he ended up living long afterwards, and he had a lot of children afterwards. Uh, but on this particular occasion, he thought he was dying. But Rasulullah told him that, no, you're actually going to live. And this is a prophecy, a prediction of Rasulullah that you're going to live afterwards. Uh, so we're not allowed to do whatever we want with our wealth right after we die right? So as we know there's an Islamic system of inheritance uh, So it needs to be distributed in the manner in which Allah has described right there in Surah An-Nisa uh, In the verses of inheritance So once you reach your deathbed then now your money is and your wealth is restricted You cannot give away more than one third And the rest of it has to be divided according to the rules and laws uh, of inheritance once you're, once you're alive and healthy you can do whatever you want with your wealth but even then, you, of course, you have to be, uh, you have to have used caution. But once you reach uh, the time or the de your deathbed or the, the sickness of death, then a person is not allowed to give away anything more than one third of their wealth. Uh, and then uh, Sa'ad ibn uh, uh, Abi Waqas, Rasulullah tells, tells him that you will get reward for whatever you spend for Allah's sake, even for whatever you put in your wife's mouth. Right? And, this, and this is possibly the reason why Imam Nawi brings this hadith in the chapter of intentions. This is an example of uh, normal actions, what we call adat, turning into ibadat, by intention. So the mere act of feeding your wife, this is a normal action. It carries no reward in it of itself. But by intention, by intending, uh, intending the reward, then you can be rewarded for that, right? just by intending it. Now some of the scholars mentioned that this is physically, literally, meaning putting something in your wife's mouth. And some of them said that it is figurative, meaning providing for your wife. Right? That it's uh, talking about providing for your wife. Whatever the case is, uh, it can be both, it can, and both can be intended. Uh, but this mere action doesn't kind of carry any reward in it of itself. But if you intend, uh, with intention, a good intention of providing for your wife, because Allah has mandated, mandated you to do so, then this becomes an act of worship upon which you are rewarded for upon which you are rewarded for. All right, at the end of this hadith, Sa'ab ibn Abi Waqas, he is, com he is uh, concerned that he would uh, pass away in Mecca because he made the hijrah to Medina and uh, they did not like to return back to Mecca after they had left it for Allah's sake. All right, so the Rasulullah would pervade the companions, whoever immigrated, that if you had to come to Mecca for Umar or Hajj, you only stayed there for three days and afterwards you leave. Otherwise, you would risk losing your hijrah. So the companions would be very afraid of coming back to Mecca, right? And they would make sure that they only remain there for a few days or they would settle somewhere outside of Mecca and not in the bounds of, uh, of, of Mecca because they were afraid of losing the reward of the hijrah. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he's a concern that, you know, maybe I'm going to stay here, I have to stay here. And if I stay here an extended period of time or if I die in Mecca, I'm going to lose the reward of my hijrah. So Rasulullah assures him that you're not going to lose your reward. All right, if you're left behind, whatever good deeds you do will upgrade and raise you high because you have an excuse. He's not there because he wants to be there. He's there because he's sick and ill. So you'll still get that reward. And then Rasulullah Sallam predicts that you will actually live long afterwards and people will, benefit to you. people will be benefited by you while others will be harmed by you. This is also a prediction. Sa'id ibn Abi Waqasi lived long and he ended up becoming one of the commanders of the, of the Muslims in the battles. And he was the head commander when the Muslims fought in the battle of Anybody know? Against the Persians. Battle of Qadisiyah. This was the decisive battle that got rid of, caused the, the, the Persian Empire to collapse and, and, 
and be gone. He was the commander of the Muslims. So, so I'm saying that people benefited by you. He was the one who conquered, all right, uh, helped conquer uh, the Persians. And others will be harmed by you because he was the one who conquered them. So we're supposed to be predicting that you will live long afterwards and you will achieve great things. And people will benefit from you, but the disbelievers will be harmed by you. And then we're supposed to make dua at the end, oh Allah, complete the emigration of my companions and do not turn them renegades. And then at the end he mentions a, a man by the name of Sa'd ibn Khawla. Uh, so he uh, said that he made the, uh, the, the immigration uh, to, uh, to Medina, but then he returned back to Mecca and he died at Mecca. So Rasulullah is saying he felt sorry for him because he kind of ended up losing the reward of his hijrah because he returned back to Mecca afterwards. Uh, so it said that he either, either he made the hijrah and then he returned back to Mecca and he died in Mecca, or he never made the uh, migration to begin with. Two, two, uh, two, two uh, views of the scholars of what the situation of this man is, Sa'ad ibn uh, Khawla. Right? Either he did not migrate at all, or he migrated, but then he returned back to Mecca and he died in Mecca. And so he ended up not getting that re full reward uh, of the Hijrah. All right, so this is hadith number six. Uh, anybody have any questions uh, on this hadith before we conclude? All right, so just a recap of what we said. Farewell Hajj, this was the last and only Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, it is permissible to complain about illness, as Sa'ad ibn, ibn Abi Waqas did so in this hadith. Right? He's complaining about it. It is permissible to complain about your illness for a valid reason. If that valid reason for treatment, or for somebody to make dua for you, or to be, give a bequest, or right? you want to give a bequest, uh, a will, or for a fatwa, or you need a fatwa, what should I do, can I make wudu in this situation, and so on. In this situation, you're allowed to mention your illness and complain about it. But if you're doing so out of anger or frustration, then you're not allowed to do so. All right? It's permissible, permissibly of gaining and gathering wealth as long as Allah's rights are fulfilled and you use this wealth correctly. Or he said the daughter inherits half of the estate if she's by herself. Uh, this shows also the importance of asking the people of knowledge. Right? You have questions about how to spend your wealth, about what to do. It's important to ask the people of knowledge so that they may direct you and give you uh, Allah's and his, and his Messenger's ruling. Uh, as we said, more than one third of your wealth is not allowed to be given away once you have reached the sickness of death. Once you're in your deathbed, then you cannot give away any more than one third. Uh, and the rest must go to the inheritors. And it is better to leave as much to those that inherit from you as much as possible. And it's better for you to leave your family rich or self sufficient rather than leaving them poor and begging people after you have left this world. All right, we see there are status of close relatives. Close relatives have more right than far relatives and those beyond. Uh, ruling on requesting one third. So Rasulullah said that you can do one third, but he also said that it is still a lot. So some scholars said that it is better to be even less than one third. All right, the, the less the better. It's, you get more reward and it's better for you to leave the wealth behind for your family rather than giving it away to non-family. And as we said, we're not free to do whatever we want with our wealth. After we have uh, passed away, this wealth has to be divided according to the, the rules and laws of inheritance. And we see uh, in this society that they don't follow these rules and we have situations where a person will die and they will leave the inheritance to a dog. And there's, there's, this is a true story. A woman died and she left the inheritance to a dog. The family didn't get anything. The dog inherited everything afterwards. All right, this, is according, this is against Islam. In Islam, after you pass away, your wealth is no longer, you have no control of it anymore. It must be divided according to the laws and rules of Islamic inheritance. Feeding a person's wife, this is an example of ada, a normal action turning into ibadah with intention. And a miracle, Rasulullah predicts that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas will live long after. He lived almost 50 years after this incident, and he had many uh, children, uh, and he was upon his hands. Muslims were able to uh, conquer many lands and bring an end to the uh, Persian Empire, uh, and it would never rose back again afterwards. Uh, with that, we'll conclude. Anybody have any questions on this hadith? Yes. Yes, so is this, the, this uh, of not returning back to Mecca, is that special to Mecca? Yes, right, because they left Mecca for Allah's sake, and Mecca was at that time, <coughs> uh, uh, Darul Kufr, was the abode of the disbelievers. 
even after it, it, it came back into the hands of the Muslims, uh, in order for them to remain, re retain that reward, because they left it for Allah's sake. They left Mecca for Allah's sake. So returning back and settling in it is as if they have, uh, they have left, they have gone back to something that they left for Allah's sake. And so for that reason, Rasulullah uh, did, did not allow the companions who migrated to settle back in Mecca. They were, they were not allowed to settle back in Mecca. This is specific uh, for uh, Mecca and, and nothing else. Allah Any other questions? Yeah, so it, uh, it, it has to do with the part of where he says that what, whatever you feed your wife, you get rewarded. Uh, so this is an example of a normal action turning into an act of worship by intention. All right, so you, by your intention, you can uh, turn a normal act of worship, which is just feeding your wife, uh, a morsel of food in her mouth. This will be regarded as an act of worship by your intention. So Allah, this is the reason why uh, it's mentioned in the chapter of the intentions. Allah, any other questions? All right, so we'll stop uh, with that for today. We have, uh, as usual, uh, refreshments and snacks in the back. Uh, we uh, thank Brother Ayam for providing uh, refreshments and snacks for today. Jazakumullahu khayran. And everyone is uh, free to partake in the snacks, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala sayyidina Muhammad. Subhanahu wa bihamdik. Nashidu Allah ila ila ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.